fifth market specialist was able to tell me the absolute lowest rent they've ever rented in a particular neighborhood within a certain parameter. And that number was great. It was within $50 of what they were telling me. And even if I got the lowest number, that'd be a great return, terrific results. And then the other thing about having people applying and teed up and lined up to rent your properties right away, just because that marketplace is so huge and so many people, that, that just gives you a sense of confidence that you're going to have a very good cash flowing property without a great deal of risk that's going to sit vacant for a month or two months and, and that sort of thing. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode number 1209. We're here with you five days a week, and today we've got part two of our guest Lawrence Kutlikoff. The conversation is really interesting, and I brought Doug back for the intro portion with me today because we were really on a roll yesterday on a lot of tangents, talking about the retirement crisis and the real economy versus the Wall Street economy, uh, the real economy versus the smoke and mirrors economy, Main Street versus Wall Street. They are different, and uh, that's important to know. Doug, welcome back. It's great to be back, Jason. So retirement crisis. We talked about ERISA yesterday. We talked about all of these different things. You were, I think we got off on our last tangent when you started talking about how important it is to think about how taxes will affect you and your retirement plans, right? Exactly, exactly. Because what we were starting from was an Investopedia article that was talking about savings by decade, in other words, you know, by people who are in their 20s versus 30s versus 40s. And where we took that was uh, some people who I know very well who've been successful. And we were talking about how they're in a tax bind because they end up having required minimum distributions or RMDs from their IRA. Well, another thing that's going to happen is that at some point, one of them is going to pass away. And as soon as that happens, they'll go from married filing jointly to just a single filer because they won't mm -hmm. be married anymore. Right. At that point, their tax brackets go up through the roof. Mm -hmm. And so how I think that comes back to your tax planning is that you need to A, save and invest enough so that you will be able to have a reasonable retirement, but also B, do it in a way that you're not going to get utterly destroyed by taxes if you end up with enough assets to where you can, in fact, retire in the way you want. Now, there are a number of people who, like myself, I don't really ever intend on, quote, retiring. I know you never intend on, quote, retiring. Retirement is overrated. I could have done it uh, over, well over a decade ago, but I chose not to. <laughs> well, and because a lot of people that, you know, when they become permanently inactive, their minds rapidly atrophy. And so I think it's really important to be engaged in some sort of value generating activity, essentially indefinitely. But it would be really nice if you didn't have to do it working for the man, you know, so that at some point you could do it on your own terms, which I think is what you've accomplished. That's, of course, what I want to accomplish. That's what I would assume that most sentient beings would want to accomplish. <laughs> well, and I'm the, still working for the man. The man is just all my customers and I love yeah. <laughs> it. So they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't bother me very much. Uh, so I like working for the man in my case. <laughs> Except for the fact they tell you that you go on too many tangents and we need to stick to the topic. I probably do that. But, you know, my mind is atrophying. I'm getting old. I'm close to retirement. So, you know, you, you got to give me a pass, folks. <laughs> I'll give you a break on this one, Jason. Okay. But I think that, you know, in addition to thinking about how much you save for retirement, you also have to think about how you save for retirement. And that's actually where, you know, because I, th I know that a lot of the conversations you have about real estate and income property aren't about its superior performance. Yesterday, we talked about how it's more firmly rooted in reality, but it's also very tax efficient. And the intricacies of the tax efficiency can get really, really important when you start getting into some kind of retirement scenario where you're trying to carefully manage how much income you recognize for the purpose of calculating taxes. 
real estate investments give you a lot of flexibility in that regard and a lot of advantages in that regard that most people don't really understand until uh, quite a ways down the road. Yeah, right, right. And and then they see these beautiful benefits that they get and you know, really realize how it's been such a great wealth creator for them. Okay, so let's look at some numbers of these different decades and let's see, you know, how we're doing. Now, you know, we, we've all heard the stuff about how people are, are in trouble, but this is sort of a the mainstream population and it's not tragically bad. I don't think they're ready for retirement, but um, it's not as bad as it would be. So let's look at the 20-somethings, okay? They don't yep. they don't have to think about this too much yet, but uh, how are they looking, Doug? Well, let's see. So I think they were saying that the 20-somethings, they typically have a, quite a bit of student loan debt, and your average monthly student loan payment was around $393 yeah, right. per month. And they were saying that they had an estimated median amount of about $16,000 saved up for retirement. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> given given that they've lot. got that no. student loan burden and that student loan will last for a while. Those are long loans. Yeah, they're yeah. going to have negative net worth for quite a while. Yeah. And one thing that was actually kind of interesting, it's semi-unrelated but still funny tidbit, I read an article saying that a, a number of 20-somethings and millennials have intentionally – put off retirement savings because they believe that global warming will destroy the planet before they are retirement age. <laughs> oh my God. What a lame excuse that is. I tell it, it's you. like, well, so live it up now. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I, I want to tell one of our favorite millennial listeners, Lisa, Lisa, I didn't say that Doug did. So get on his case. She's always <laughs> giving me a hard time making fun of millennials. Sorry, millennials. Hey, listen, I have tons of millennial friends, you know, but you pick on your own generation too. It's not just me. So yeah, <laughs> okay. My observation about millennials has been that I well, think- Hey, the, Doug, the, you're, you're almost a millennial yourself. I'm technically a Gen X, yeah. but I'm at the absolute end of the tail. You barely made it in. Yeah. Barely yeah. made it in. Yeah. But yeah, my observation about millennials has been that the best and brightest millennials are some of the best and brightest people I've yeah, seen or heard of, period. Hey, they, they had all the advantages. They grew up with computers, and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't yeah, get all that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but the useless millennials are some of the most useless people I've ever experienced, period. Well, it's, yeah. it's almost like the extremes are getting more extreme. It is kind of an extreme thing. Yeah, That's why you can't stereotype, of course. And, you know, one of the things that we talked about at the last, uh, not the last Meet the Masters, but the one before that, that uh, when John Burns was on stage, he talked about how, you know, you can't really even characterize it by these generational cohorts that the demographers no. use. And he likes to do it by decade. You know, if you were born in the 60s, if you were born in the 70s, if you were born in the 80s, the 90s, you know, then because it's too big of a spread, really, you know, that's one of the things about it. But that doesn't really answer the question about the, the brilliant ones and the useless ones at the same time, too. So... Anyway, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. How are the thirty somethings doing? They've got about forty five thousand dollars saved. Yep. It looks like right. Yep. Thirty somethings are getting a little better. Yeah. One of the things that it said in the article was, and it's funny because even these articles, they're all still tilted toward uh, equity investing. Yeah. Uh, it's saying, hey, you know, if you're a thirty something, you still have time to weather some downswings, so you don't have to be too conservative in your investment choices. And presumably that's saying, hey, you know, you can, you know, you can go buy a market index or an aggressive market index because, you know, you have time to go through a few corrections. But that you could also just as aptly say, you know, if you pick up a few properties in your thirties, yeah, you have a way long time yeah. to wait for to you know to yeah. let those things amortize. <laughs> and you know, by the time you get in your fifth and 60s, those properties would be performing pretty well. Okay, so let's just talk about that a moment. This was the big, boring idea that we talked about at the last Meet the Masters conference, okay? And the big, boring yes. idea is amortization. And it is amazing, Doug. I mean, look, there are more sexy and exciting things about income property than amortization. Obviously, that's why it's called the big, boring idea. But, you know, on some of the graphs that you, you did research for, mm -hmm. it's amazing how significant that is when you get into year number 10. So if you're 30 today, 
you know, you're the millennial we're talking about. By the time you're 40, yeah. and folks, believe me, it'll be here faster than you think. I am amazed Ten at how fast. 10 years goes by pretty quick. Oh, 20 years goes by really quick, too. It's shocking. I mean, I remember... Yeah, Jason, I, you get, get some kids like involved. Yesterday. Time will go yeah. by even faster. Yeah, oh, I believe Get it. some kids involved. Yeah. It'll go by even faster. There you go. There you go. So time goes really fast. You'll be 40 before you know it, okay? And that amortization really adds to your return on investment. And there's a hybrid strategy on this because a lot of you like our refi till you die strategy, and I love it myself. I think it's great. But the hybrid strategy is, and we don't know how it'll play out because it just depends. You have to make the judgment at the time and nobody can predict the future. So you might leave your first loan on your property and let it amortize and refi on a second loan to pull cash out. Or you might not do the refi till you die strategy at all. You might do it on part of your portfolio, not all of your portfolio. You might not do it at all, or you might refi everything and get the refi till you die advantage. So it's either one or the other or a hybrid. You can do a hybrid in between the two strategies, which may well be the best. Who knows? Well, you know, we can only judge at the time in the future. But um, staying on amortization for just another second, the thing that I like the most about it is that it has a Warren Buffett feature to it, which mm -hmm. is that it requires absolutely no effort or action on the part of the right. owner or the tenant. Yeah. It happens by itself automatically, whether you do anything to keep it going or not. Yeah. And that is truly, utterly beautiful. It is because, it is, yeah. because the, you know, as I've gotten older, not that I'm old, you know, my kids would say different, but as mm -hmm. I've gotten older, I've gotten to where I really appreciate things that don't have to be complicated mm -hmm. because, you know, right, you know, a lot of times you get people who are, you know, who are smart and ambitious and they like to think about how smart they are because they can understand things that are really complicated. Yeah. But if you get things that work and are really simple, that's excellent because trying to remember how a lot of complicated things work is really hard to do. <laughs> oh, this is, look, so this is why it's simple. Uh, it'll yeah. get a lot easier to manage. A, a lot of people with advanced degrees are their own worst enemy, you know, or, or people that are really smart can be their own worst enemy because some of the best things like income property are really pretty simple. I mean, you can fine tune it and tweak it and make it more complicated. And, you know, uh, guilty as charged over here. Okay, I do that. <laughs> you know, and we do it on the show. We talk to you all about it. But it's really pretty simple asset class. So overall, now, by the time people get into their 40s, though, this is where they seem to hit the danger zone, right? Because in the article, it says statistically, most Americans are dangerously behind at this point, with an estimated median savings of only $63,000. And now they're in their 40s. Yep. So this is starting to be when it's urgent. And by the way, I don't know what you'd think about this or anybody listening who's been to our conferences and our other live events, but I would say that our average client who's buying properties through our network is probably right about their mid 40s. It seems to be that people really, I mean, the ones that wake up and boy, sorry for the ones who don't, but the ones who wake up they usually wake up like in their right about the time they turn 40 and they think, hey, look, the government's not going to be there for me. I've watched my parents age. I know older people now, you know, Drew, who's been on the show many times, one of our clients and one that's really teaching people a lot about self-management. I, I was at his house one time and he was uh, meeting uh, this guy for lunch who was like a retired DA that worked with his wife. And, and I said, well, you're meeting this guy at Chipotle for lunch and he's like 75 years old and you're like 30. What what are you hanging out with him for? And, and Drew said something to be funny. And he, and he said, Oh, he's a good friend of mine. You know, when you're over 30, it doesn't matter how old anybody is anymore. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> you know, uh, I just thought it was kind of a mismatch. Like that doesn't seem like your peer group, but, uh, but yeah, so here we get in danger in the forties, right? Well, I would say danger and opportunity because forties typically are when you get into your peak earning years. And in days gone by, that they were also the time when your kids, if you were having kids, were starting to get to where they were getting toward college age and they were starting to move out. So in your 40s and 50s, a lot of times is when you can do your most aggressive wealth accumulation if you really focus on it. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. That's definitely the time. 
Most of our clients come to us, they're in their 40s, and they want to start piling up income properties. Many of them do, you know, like we've had on the show. I mean, uh, Dave and Gina are one of the recent client case study interviews we did, and, and they are just piling up a bunch of properties. I think, I don't know, we published that episode recently. I think he said they had 26 doors now. And they only started with us like three years ago. I mean, wow, that's that's impressive. It really is. That's pretty rapid. Yeah, it's awesome. Good job. Uh, and we have many other clients that are taking the bull by the horns and, and really doing good stuff like that. So congrats to all of you. Okay, in the 50s, so now people in their 50s, what does their picture look like? About 117 grand which is not a ton. No, not when you're in your 50s. It's not um, because you are getting really close now. Yeah, you're getting there. And 60s, I think, is about 172,000, which is really not that much because, I mean, again, yeah, it'll all depend on the rate of returns you can earn. But even when you're looking at, say, traditional equity rates of return, which are around 8%, and in my view, I think that's unsustainable over the long term. That's a topic for another day. But you know, even if at 8% rates of return, you need way more capital than that if you're going to maintain even a modest lifestyle. And that's assuming that Social Security is around. Yeah, and yeah, well, (laughs) Social Security is bankrupt, obviously, we know that, but they keep paying uh, for now. So one of the things that is really depressing about this, and, and, you know, this article is a financial services industry publication, right? It's the wall, you know, it's one of the many mouthpieces for the vast Wall Street conspiracy, okay? One of the really depressing things is the last paragraph in the 60-somethings. Do you want to read that, Doug? I mean, Sure, can yeah, 60-somethings, look. yeah. Median savings for 60-somethings is 172000 Right, but below that, the next this paragraph. Oh, yes, where it's a de- decade you can start receiving Social Security. Average monthly benefit is $1,413 a month. Right, but you passed over the middle sentence, and that's the one I want people to hear. That's the one that depresses me. It says, most seniors find this, meaning Social Security, to be a significant source of monthly income. And it goes on to say that the average Social Security benefit in 2018 was $1,400 per month. Wow. That's That's considered. That's considered a significant source of monthly income. Isn't that depressing? It is. Wow. Because you think about it, that'll pay for rent on a (laughs) a C-class property. With one bedroom. uh, Yeah, with with one bedroom in the upper Midwest. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I can tell you because I own a C-class apartment <laughs> complex in the Midwest. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. So yeah, that's pretty sad. Doug, let's wrap it up and get to part two of Lawrence Kutlikoff. Uh, closing thought. Closing thought is plan smart and you're going to make it. Good advice. Let's go to part two of Lawrence Kutlikoff. And here we go. It's my pleasure to welcome Lawrence Kutlikoff back to the show. He is a professor at Boston University, a very renowned economist who has uh, probably done more study and research on our unfunded mandate problem that we will talk about today. Can't wait to dive into that again. And he's also a software entrepreneur, and he's got some great software tools to help planning for all of this stuff. Is the future inflationary, deflationary, stagnationary? Uh, And then what do we do about it? I certainly would not buy long-term U.S. Treasury bonds uh, okay. that are not inflation indexed. Right. I wouldn't buy any long-term corporate bond. I wouldn't buy any bond denominated in dollars beyond a couple of years in terms of maturity. And I've you know, steadfastly stayed away from such securities personally ever since I started seeing this problem. Okay. Because I, I think we will print money, and I don't think it will do much for us. But it will happen. Yeah. Okay. So that's inflationary is sort of the net of that, it sounds like. So what do we do about it? I mean, planning becomes even more important. Last time you were on the show, we talked about your software that helps uh, divorcing couples divide assets, which is really quite a bit more complicated than it, it seemed before I took a look at your software. And you've got some other software that helps people plan for the future in in many ways with a great degree of detail. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I'll do that. Let me just say uh, right before I get into that, there's a website called purpleplans.org, www.purpleplans.org. 
where I talk about what I would do if I were running the country to fix the $239 trillion fiscal gap, mm -hmm. how to fix Social Security, how to fix health care, how to fix taxes, how to fix banking. Anyway, sure. so uh, dot, uh, org. Why is it purple? Why the Purple's name? like a mixture of red and blue. Okay. Oh, okay. Got it. Got yeah. it. Okay. Uh, got it. All the okay. Democrat, right. Okay, good. Okay. So planning for the future, what do we do? Well, we each need to have a long-term financial plan. I think anybody who's a grown-up would understand the importance of that. But I've been uh, spending the last 34 years, uh, actually now it's now 35 years, uh, 36 years now. <laughs> it's now, later it's, than you think. <laughs> it's now, not, yeah, 36 years ago I started uh, this company. We have a tool called Maxify.com. It's M-A-X-I-F-I.com. It's a financial planning software tool that helps you figure out, based on economics principles, how to uh, have a secure living standard into the future, and also how to safely raise your living standard, and also how to invest your money to limit the riskiness of your living standard. So economics is all about your living standard, because we're, we're into uh, trying to have you have a, a smooth level of consumption, a smooth lifestyle through time, because we don't want to be partying today and start eating cat food when we're older, right? Mm -hmm. That's not our objective in right. life. Nor do we want to starve today and party when we're 90. We might not even make it to 90. We, we want to balance it out, right? We want to have a smooth path, right? Okay. So conventional financial planning tools don't give you a smooth plan, path. The first thing they ask you is how much you want to spend in retirement. Well, my answer is I'd like to spend a billion dollars a day in retirement. It's a stupid question because, you know, you can only spend based on what your resources are. Our software realizes that. We ask about how much you've gotten, how much you're earning now and in, into the future when you're going to retire, how much assets you have, regular assets, retirement account assets, and you know other kinds of questions about your assets, your off-the-top expenses on housing and so forth. And then we figure out the smooth living standard path for a household member. We say, okay, we've taken all that information and we've used really smart algorithms that uh, I developed based on my uh, economic research uh, program to uh, figure out in about a half a second how much you should spend such as you can keep on spending it every year for the rest of your life. Okay, now we have your living standard path, and then the program will robo-optimize that. It will look at uh, Social Security uh, benefit collection strategies and how to deal with your retirement accounts uh, so that you don't pay more taxes than you need to to get your living standard from here to here. Mm -hmm. The software is also dealing with your cash flow issues because your living standard may not be perfectly smooth if you – for example, I'll have a big inheritance coming in the future, uh, your living standard will jump up at some point when you get that inheritance. So, because you can't borrow against it. Mm -hmm. So, or you have big bills to pay, like a mortgage and college tuition, you're gonna have to have a living standard down here and then it will jump up. So the software is really great in dealing with that issue that's very important for about uh, Larry, anyway, so, I, I, know, got, I, gotta, I gotta interrupt you because I have a big idea here. You just made me think of something. Remember how they used to sell viaticals and now they still do a light like a life insurance thing. I invested in one of those and lost money on it. It was it was a scam. But um, here's another financial instrument. Wall Street, are you listening? Financial innovation. Here you go. How about a loan against a future inheritance? The millennials would love this. They could eat avocado toast all day long, never be responsible, and then <laughs> they could borrow against an inheritance. <laughs> it's like a reverse mortgage, you know? Oh, yeah, I think that would happen if the courts would uh, enforce it. Yeah, yeah. It's a, well, security. It's a good idea. And <laughs> I just need to get the legal system around to letting this happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, and here's the reason it can't happen, by the way, because number one, it would be an incentive to kill okay. people, but so is life insurance, really. And number two, basically, if your parents had to contract away the inheritance and could not change their will or their living trust, you know, then you wouldn't treat them nicely until the end. So, you know, that wouldn't be a very good deal for yeah, them. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of difficulties with this market. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we're back to smoothing your living standard, raising it. And by the way, you can tell the program that you think Social Security benefits are going to be cut and or taxes raised. So that's part of the, yeah. the software. So you can, can, can you put in your projected inflation rate, I suppose? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the program is going to tell you, okay, here's how much to save this year and every year in the future. Here's how much to spend. Here's how much life insurance to buy. So your survivors have to the dollar the same living standard. And then uh, it's going to raise your living standard. And then uh, it's also going to uh, say, okay, 
tell us about how you're investing your assets. So we set up a, uh, a base uh, plan for how you're going to invest. And then we compare that with a risky strategy and a safer strategy. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we run what are called Monte Carlo simulations, which are we run, let's say you're running the program. The software is going to run 500 trajectories of your living standard based on the returns you would get on your ass assets that you're holding, let's say, in your base case. Mm -hmm. Then we say, OK, let's feed all those um, trajectories of your living standard. First of all, we show you what they look like, how spread out they are. And then uh, we say, well, let's uh, plug those into a mathematical function that that trades off you're being happier if you get to consume more, but also you're being less happy if you're with a downside risk. So it kind of trades off risk and return. Hmm. And economists call this expected utility. So what we do is we show you the expected utility from your base plan, from uh, investing in a more risky way, investing in a safer way. And you get to, by, by playing around with this tool, you get to see what's the optimal portfolio for you to hold, given your degree of risk aversion. Hmm. Interesting. Well, Interesting. This is what economics has been saying to do for decades, really. Modern uh, portfolio theory and economics started in the 1950s. So we have like 60 years. And this is the first tool that actually is bringing economic portfolio recommendations or economics portfolio analysis and recommendations to the public in a simple tool at maxify.com. That's really interesting. How long, you know, it just begs the question, it sounds complicated. How long does it take to input one's data and set it up so they can find out the answers? Well, the, the program works like TurboTax, so it's a very easy interface. I'm going to give you a copy to still take a look. So it's just, you know, first question is, what's your name? You know, mm -hmm. are you married? What's your spouse name? Yeah. Do you have kids? So it's question by question. So it's a wizard. It holds your hand. And then after, you, after you've entered the inputs, which might take you a half an hour, if you have mm -hmm. your information about your assets, might may take you a little bit longer. But how long does it take to go see a doctor to have an annual checkup, right? Yeah, right. It takes at least an hour. So yeah. you do this, and then you hit, you know, produce a report, base case re report, and it shows you uh, by holding your hand, uh, here's your lifetime budget. Here's all your resources. Here's how much you're going to get to spend on a mm -hmm. lifetime basis on discretionary spending. And by the way, the next slide is going to show you how to spend it evenly, smoothly, so you have a smooth living standard per household member. And so it's walking you through the results, holding your hand. So it may uh, seem like it's complicated because it's designed by an economist, but we actually had real designers who interact with the public. Who are not, <laughs> not, not just you ivory tower folks, right? <laughs> it's not, yeah. It was, it's a user interface that was developed by non-economists. Yeah. And uh, so it's actually a very user-friendly. It was written up. About uh, last August, the New York Times, they did a, a, um, a writer wrote a, an article about what to do five years before retirement. Mm -hmm. And it was a big article. And it said uh, the first thing to do five years from retirement is to buy Maxify Planner and run it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. You and know what? Didn't mention any other program. Yeah. You, you know what's kind of interesting about this in talking to you about it is that. Uh, most of these uh, programs and reports and projections and really the financial planning community in general are built around this concept of frugality, right? You know, save for retirement. What what I think some listeners might discover, this won't be true for all, but, you know, maybe a little less than half or, or so of at least my listeners, I got a pretty sophisticated crowd I think they'll discover that they might not be spending enough money and enjoying life that's enough. You know, that's yeah. that's an interesting take, right? Because nobody has done lifetime budgeting for them. Yeah. Say, well, how much can they spend right after the maximum age of life? We don't. We plan for people to live it to. Uh, well, the default value is a hundred. Mm -hmm. So we're not focused on you're dying early, so you need to save more. Right. You know, the financial industry is engaged in so many different types of. Uh, product sales and efforts when it comes to their software and the way they do their financial planning. It has, it really bears no relationship to consumption smoothing to this idea of having mm -hmm. a smooth living standard and then safely raising it. It's actually giving you advice. that's pretty much the exact opposite of what rec economics recommends. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting because uh, a lot of people though, you know, to just look forward to maybe the great next, technology that's coming for life extension, you know, we might have too much life left at the end of the money. That's most people will have that problem. Uh, but, problem. Yeah. but, but, yeah. and it's sort of a good problem to have in a way, <laughs> I guess. But, 
it's not a financial problem. No, it's, yeah. it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. But some will, well, I mean, I'm just saying it's good to live longer, right? You know, yeah. generally. But some will find out that they really need to enjoy today a little more, I think. That's the interesting thing about this. Even if they plan to live to 100 or 110, you can yeah. do that in our program. Yeah. You can change the maximum age of life. But yeah, it, there's lots of people that are oversaving mm-hmm. because they're overly scared about their finances. But yeah. and but we have lots of other people that aren't under saving because they think Social Security is going to be bigger than it is. They think their retirement account money is going to last longer, but they forget about the taxes that are due on it. The program mm-hmm. is super careful about taxes and uh, both federal and state. Mm-hmm. Medicare Part B premiums are really a, a big issue for older people. Yeah. And then also, of course, you've got all the Social Security benefits. There are 11 different benefits this, the program calculates. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. You know, one of the things that people need to think about is when should they start taking their Social Security? Should they take it as soon as they can or should they wait a little longer and get a higher amount? You know, these are all big questions. Yeah, and the program is optimizing over those choices. Mm -hmm. So if you say you're going to pass away at um, 80, Mm -hmm. the program is going to think differently about if you say that's your maximum age of life, you're absolutely convinced you're going to die at that date, you know, before that date. The program is going to decide, you know, may have you take your benefits earlier uh, rather than have you wait till 70 to get a much higher number. Well, there's probably about 3 million people that can get free spouse benefits if their own, if their other spouse takes their benefits somewhat early in order to get them going on getting a free spouse benefit because they're still grand, they're grand- grandfathered under the old uh, Social Security law that mm-hmm. was pre-2015. Yeah. So the software will figure all this stuff out and, and tell you here's what to do. That's great. So it's Maxify.com, right? M-A-X-I-F-I.com, yeah. All right, Larry, thanks again for joining us. It's always great to talk to you, and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, just a closing thought on the economy or where it's going or what people should do, anything. Yeah, the economy uh, is doing pretty well, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of real wage growth, which is what we're hoping for, because the economy is, you know, workers have not seen major wage increases for decades. Yeah, 41 years. Yeah. So even though the unemployment rate is low, which is great, you know, our real incomes are not rising. Uh, so we have lots of productivity growth, but it's not going to the typical worker. It's going to the super rich. Yeah. Well, it's the winner take all society problem. That's, and the, yeah, yeah. the, the C class executives are keeping all the money for themselves. And there's another uh, resource uh, called um, at Kotlikoff.net called You're Hired a Trump Playbook for Fixing America's Economy. It's mm-hmm. a book. It's a free book at Kotlikoff.net. Mm-hmm. You just download it. There's a tax reform there. I've got a different one at purpleplans.org, but the tax reform at um, this book, on this book, which is, uh, again, called You're Hired rather than You're Fired, right? You're right. Yeah, I get, I get it. <laughs> I get the reference. <laughs> Ask the, the rich to pay their fair share of taxes by taxing their consumption. Mm-hmm. So it talks about uh, having a progressive consumption tax. The national so, sales tax idea. Yeah, but just for the, the rich, you know, mm-hmm. if you're consuming more than like $250,000 a year, mm-hmm. you have to pay taxes on your consumption. Yeah. At a yeah, that's, work. that's I, I've always debated that. And, you know, that's a topic for another show. But would you reduce consumption? Would you get people that are just hoarders and misers then? And I don't know, you know, that's this is uh, complicated. <laughs> no, I don't think the super rich, the reason President Trump has not revealed his tax returns is that he hasn't paid any taxes. Yeah. This is not unusual for people who are super wealthy. I mean, suppose you... Oh, I, had a, I, I believe it. I mean, look, Trump's a real estate guy. You get depreciation. It's the best tax write-off in the world, yeah, right? If, here's an even... You know, suppose I'm not in real estate, but I have a billion dollars. What I do, Jason, is I just go borrow... Let's say I have it in stock. Yeah. Okay, well, my billion dollars worth of stock, and the stocks are appreciating, and I don't want to sell any of them because I'll have to pay taxes on capital gains. So what I do is I borrow against the stock. I pledge the stocks. So I borrow to consume. I can borrow as much as I want against these stocks at a low rate. And then when I die, I leave the stocks to my kids who don't have to pay the capital gains taxes because the basis steps up. Step up in basis. Yeah. That's the way the rich do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and they do other things. They have offshore accounts and they have captive insurance companies and they do all kinds of things that are so complex. It's, it's you know, they pay lawyers and accountants hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, if not more, to right. set up these vehicles because it's worth it. There's an incentive, you know, it's incentivized. So it's, time, it's time to, yes, I, there are, our economy will not suffer if the rich pay uh, their fair share. And yeah. 
certainly the country in general needs tax revenue like crazy. So, Well, this is all complicated stuff, and I'd love to debate this more. I do want to have you back to talk about the big con, okay? So let's do that for sure. sure. All right? Okay, absolutely, yeah. All right, Lawrence Kutlikoff, thanks for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.